Keep America great. I know a predator when I see one. They want to defund the police. I will draw on the best of us. Republicans reject science. Four more years. Hello and welcome to the debated podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Ethan Kelly from the YouTube channel, the very successful YouTube channel, Let's Talk Elections. Welcome to the podcast, Ethan. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, So the first question that I'd like to ask is, what was your uh, initial reaction to the uh, results that have come out in uh, the US, in the US presidential election? Was it a surprise or had you anticipated uh, 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 what's happened? So on the first night of the election, I was pretty surprised. But as we started counting all of the ballots, uh, I sort of saw the direction that the country was going. I wasn't too surprised um, by the election results. I expected Joe Biden to win. I thought it would be by a larger margin, uh, as did many people. But at the end of the day, a lot of the states that I called and a lot of other people that expected certain states to go blue versus red, they ended up that way. And overall, this election was surprisingly not that shocking, to say the least. On the presidential level, now, the other elections, down-ballot races were kind of surprising, but for the presidential level, I'd say I wasn't too surprised. Um, Now, one thing that perhaps has taken some people uh, aback, mainly people who perhaps haven't been following us as closely, is perhaps the uh, difference or seeming difference between some of the polling and the results. Do you think that the polls were in any way out of sync or do you think that they uh, got it pretty much as how it has uh, occurred? So I would say that the polls were off in terms of their margin. A lot of them did predict the winner correctly. Um, The people who led in the polls, I believe only a few states were off in terms of who was the projected winner. But the margins were really important. A lot of states were expected to either be closer or larger margin. There was Trump winning or Biden winning. Uh, And once we actually saw the results and laid out for us over the past couple of days, it seemed very reminiscent of 2016. A lot of the states actually haven't shifted too heavily. Um, and, And the margins that we saw were not necessarily close to where they were in terms of the polling data. So the polling data, I would say, was off in terms of how large or small victories uh, of their victories were for either Donald Trump or Joe Biden. But a lot of them did get the projected winner correctly. I think that they just either oversampled a certain party or there were a, a number of errors that could have made it seem as if Joe Biden would have done really well in this state or Donald Trump would have done really well. But as we saw on election night and practically election week, that a lot of states did end up becoming uh, extremely close. Um, now, you mentioned oversampling there. Do you think that part of the issue is that, you know, this this fact that has been discussed quite a bit on um, cable news, the idea of shy Trump voters, do you think that Republicans weren't responding as much uh, to being asked uh, questions by the different polling companies? And that's why there uh, seems to be a under-reckoning of uh, support for the president. Well, I'd say that, yes, there is. Um, as we've seen now, uh, a shy Trump vote. I honestly didn't expect there to be this significant of a bump for Donald Trump in terms of the results versus the actual polling data. Um, But I don't think because they don't trust the polling uh, that they don't respond. Um, I think it's more so, I mean, they end up calling enough Republicans and enough Democrats and enough independents, but there's a problem in the polling system where sometimes they'll call based off party registration and people don't tend to update that too heavily. Um, I do think that the idea of the shy Trump supporter definitely exists. Uh, That's definitely a thing in America. However, I don't think that's why the polling data was off. I think that uh, people were either lying to pollsters um, and that could have really, uh, really hurt Joe Biden if the polls were just slightly uh, more incorrect. Um, When people answer these polls, they may be more inclined to say that they're voting for Democrats because they feel as if they may be Uh, scrutinized or that the polling data may be public, whatever it is. I think that the problem was people lying to the public uh, or to the pollers. And then also on top of that, there just could have been issues with the methodology. So yes, there are shy Trump voters, but I don't think that's the main culprit for uh, the uh, polling inaccuracies. In terms of the methodology, do you think that part of the issue was just the sample size? Because I know that I've seen some people saying that, well, you know, how can you uh, properly get a, a picture of which way a state will go from, say, 700 people responding? Do you think that that's something that going forward to the midterms and, and the next election that pollsters have to be mindful of that perhaps they need to um, poll more people? Well, we've seen polls in the past that have polled 
thousands of people versus hundreds of people. And generally, they end up with the same results. Generally, we see a thousand people polled in national polls and statewide polls just because, number one, polls cost a lot of money to do, whether a campaign's doing it or a polling firm is doing it, it costs a lot of money. And they receive probably a 1% pickup rate. So it's really hard for them to get um, a lot of data. And on top of that, just expanding the electorate, if they're using the same exact methodology, it would just be doubling their data, really, if they're going from 1000 to 2000, uh, the result would probably end up being the same. And they try to hit every single part of a demographic group, whether they're calling white college educated voters or non college educated minority voters, whatever it might be, they hit a quota with their uh, demographic groups, and they apply it and they uh, use the vote share from 2016 or 2018. And they apply that so I don't think that the sample size is what's really throwing it off either. Um, just the way that they could possibly be approaching the poll altogether. Um, and also, it's just very difficult now in order to uh, get an, a very honest answer out of an uh, American voter. So I don't really think that the sample size would change much if we were to expand it. We've seen polls in the past that have a very large sample size or also very small sample size. They generally have the same result. Now, just going back to the um, shy Trump voters for a moment, uh, President Trump, of course, uh, has seen an, an increase in the amount of votes that he's received uh, this election. And I think that the only group in which support for him has fallen has been um, white men. Why do you think that there has been this increased uh, support for President Trump? Do you think that it's simply a case of people worried about um what the Democrats might uh, do if elected, buying into the, the president's uh, campaign message of, of law and order? Or do you think that it's something much more complicated than that? Well, there's always layers into why a certain demographic group is voting a certain way. We saw Donald Trump do exceptionally well with uh, Hispanic Latino voters across this country, specifically in Florida and Texas. Um, this race could have been a blowout for Biden. Had the numbers remained the same in terms of minority groups, uh, and white women in 2016, we probably would have seen Joe Biden win states such as North Carolina and possibly even Florida. Um, but President Trump's message resonated well with a bunch of different demographic groups. Not only did he talk about law and order, which was very important to suburban voters. On top of that, he pretty much labeled Joe Biden throughout the entirety of the campaign season as a socialist. And that actually resonated really well with Hispanic voters across the country. And I also think it's on the fault of the Democratic Party that they didn't really dispel these rumors, uh, nor did they actively campaign uh, too heavily for minority voters. A lot of what they did, whether it was the convention with bringing in Republicans to speak um, or focusing on their Republicans for Biden movement, a lot of what they did was aimed at winning over white women specifically and suburban voters. And that's the group that the Democratic Party really targeted on. And I think while they did take minority groups for advantage, uh, took advantage of their vote in 2016, um, I think they really expected it to be the same exact uh, composition. And while Biden may have seen increased turnout in major cities such as Milwaukee, that helped him in Wisconsin, but also increased turnout amongst minority groups that skewed a little bit more to the right than normal uh, helped Donald Trump. So Donald Trump's message, whether it was law and order or Joe Biden being a socialist candidate, whatever it was, it really resonated with uh, a lot of these voters. Do you think that... Um Part of the results we've seen, and I'm thinking particularly of the um, results in the House of Representatives, is that perhaps people were more focused on um, whether they wanted Trump in or out uh, rather than on uh, the particular policy issues. Because I know that, you know, obviously there have been uh, some very interesting discussions about policy. But if you look at the presidential uh, debates, there wasn't really that much discussion of policy. Do you think that? Part of what happened is that voters just got swamped in this uh, binary. Are you pro-Trump? Are you anti-Trump? I mean, yeah, uh, every election, you're always going to see both candidates uh, idealize, number one, and number two, and that they are going to be, you know, the main people that you're focusing on. And a lot of what we saw in the debate, a lot of what American voters, number one, and what a lot of what we heard was about leadership. We mm -hmm. talked about how Joe Biden would have handled COVID-19 differently or how Donald Trump did some things with COVID correctly, whatever it was, both candidates really talked about themselves. And that really, I would say, ended up hurting the Democratic Party down ballot. Um, 
not having a major policy platform to work towards didn't benefit them on the House of Representatives level, nor did it benefit them on the Senate level. They dabbled in the idea of court packing. They dabbled in the idea um, of adding two new states. And I think at the end of the day, not having that centralized platform that they uh, could really go behind other than being anti-Trump or, you know, attacking their Republican colleagues or Republican opponents for what they did and how they've been with Donald Trump. A lot of the ads that we saw were tying these Republican candidates to Trump. And while Trump may have lost some of these states where Republicans won, such as Maine with Susan Collins, um, Donald Trump was the main focus of the Democratic Party. But for the Republican Party, I don't think Joe Biden was their main focus. I think their main focus was enacting President Trump's um, proposed uh, or supported legislation in the House of Representatives and the Senate. He asked for a red wave. And while he didn't get a red wave, he certainly increased his numbers uh, or the Republican Party increased their numbers in the House of Representatives. And um, the Democrats have picked up one seat, one net seat in the uh, Senate so far. So I, we still have a little bit to go to see whether or not the Democratic Party will be able to retake the Senate majority. But uh, the congressional race is really hurt because the Democratic Party wasn't able to establish a clear message as to what they were fighting for rather than just uh, being anti-Trump. They really needed something to fight for, and they really didn't give it to the voters. And now I'm just turning to the Senate. Um, the balance of the Senate seems uh, to be... Uh, is, is going to be decided with the two special elections uh, in Georgia, which uh, the runoffs uh, for which are going to come in January. Which way do you think uh, that they are going to go? Do you think that the Democrats will take those seats or do you think that the Republicans will hold on to them? Uh, right now, I would say that the Republican Party is probably the favorite to win in the David Perdue seat. I'm a little bit more skeptical about Kelly Loeffler just because of her um, radical history, I'd say. Uh, it's very difficult for me to envision this election, even though it is very close. Um, it only just started. And we mm. I don't think I'm going to be looking at polling data to give me an indicator of who's going to win this election. But I do think that when we're looking at this Senate race, it's probably going to be the most expensive in history. And it's only just getting started. The Democratic Party has already raised six million dollars for these two Senate races. Um, we're probably going to see at least 50 million dollars across both, if not for each Senate race. So I don't have a solid prediction right now. There's a little bit to go. Um, but if I was to say, you know, place my bets on something, I would say that David Perdue is reelected, the Republican, and then uh, the Democrat Raphael Warnock defeats Kelly Loeffler. But uh, that would take split ticketing, which actually wasn't too common this election specifically. So uh, it's really up for grabs. I think the Republicans are the favorite just to retain Senate majority, just because if they win one out of the two Senate seats in Georgia, they retain their majority, but um, it still could go either way. Mm. Do you think that part of the issue that uh, Republicans might face in not just in the Georgia elections, but in all other upcoming elections, may be a sense of apathy from Republican voters and supporters, the feeling that, oh, well, you know, the, the Democrats and Joe Biden stole this election. Therefore, what's the point of voting? Do you think that that's going to impact us all on the result? Actually, I think the opposite would happen just because. You know, while the Republican Party is dismantling American trust in the electoral process, they're they saying, you know, these results are not legitimate. They have refused to start the transition. Um, I, I honestly think that this is not good for America as a whole. It's not really a partisan issue. It's hmm. the election results are done. Joe Biden is going to be inaugurated. Uh, but I don't think that this is going to hurt the GOP in terms of turnout. While they may be skeptical about this, the, the reality of the voting results, I think this actually inspires them more. If they think that this election was stolen, they're going to show out in full force. If there's someone who didn't vote and believes that the Democratic Party stole the election because the president is telling them them, because their senator is telling them that, because their representative is telling them that, they may be more inclined to vote next time to counteract what they think is an election being stolen or um bring out, you know, more voters that typically don't vote. But if they think this election was stolen, they actually may be, may be more inclined to vote just to have their voice heard. Um, just to say, you know, if this election is stolen, you're not going to steal this one. And that's something that I think will actually benefit the Republican Party almost immediately, probably even in the upcoming Senate elections. Um, now, do you think that the uh, strong support for the Democrats in Georgia has been, as a, a lot of people have suggested, down to the um, work in particular of, of Stacey Abrams? Or do you think that perhaps this is the result of a, a longer uh, trend, which has slowly over successive elections uh, shifted the balance in, in, in terms of which party is more likely to um, take 
the state in a presidential election. I mean, when we're looking at the state of Georgia itself, I think that Stacey Abrams really deserves a lot of the uh, uh, the benefit. I mean, she worked tirelessly uh, mm-hmm. throughout this past two years, even really four years. Since 2016, the Democratic Party has been eyeing up Georgia as a potential pickup, whether it was in the governor election in 2018 or it was the presidential election this time. Um, the Democratic Party, sure, would have targeted this, you know, had Hillary Clinton won the presidency. But I really think that because Donald Trump served out the four years, that hurt him, number one, with uh, the Republican voters that were not too inclined to vote for him the first time. And then Stacey Abrams really laid out the ground game. She discussed this on an interview about how, uh, you know, they invested in city council races. They invested mm-hmm. in localized races. They invested in state legislature races because they needed to uh, lay the foundation that even past this election that the Democratic Party could do well in Georgia. And I think that she, uh, a lot of Democrats should really be thanking her because rather than potentially take a vice presidential spot under Joe Biden or even run for president herself or even run for Senate this election. She spent more time focusing on this state and flipping it on the presidential level. And while we're headed to two runoffs, that would not have happened had Stacey Abrams not remained in the state of Georgia, had not continued fighting for the Democratic Party. I mean, I think her work, while sure, the state itself could have flipped, we probably weren't seeing it uh, this close until 2024, 2028, had she not expedited the process over the past two years. And I think the Democratic Party owes her a great deal because of this state. And it is on track to go to Biden. I think he's up 12,000 votes now. And that would have not been possible without Stacey Abrams. Um, Do you uh, think, I mean, we've discussed this in terms of the result in the Senate and the House of Representatives. Do you think that if the Senate um, stays with the Republicans and the House of Representatives stays with the Democrats, that Joe Biden is going to find it fairly difficult to get anything done. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We saw this happen with uh, President Obama when the Republican Party held Congress and he was obviously the president during his second term. Um, I think that Mitch McConnell is going to do everything he can in order to prevent Joe Biden from doing what he wants, whether that comes down to who he puts in his administration. I mean, Mitch McConnell has already started the discussion of blocking potential uh, administration nominees, and that's practically... I would say out of the ordinary. I mean, we don't see this happen. I understand America is partisan, but this is extreme. Before Joe Biden has even considered any names or laid out any names to discuss, Mitch McConnell has already said, you know, if he is elected president, which he has been, um, he would block all of these potential nominees. And I think that is really unfortunate for the American people, just because we are probably going to see one of the least productive administrations uh, for the first two years. And A lot of people are going to attribute it to Joe Biden and say that it's his fault. But a divided uh, government, while in theory should work together and should compromise, that never happens, especially here. And I think that Joe Biden is going to face a lot of trouble if the Republican Party is to retain the Senate, which they are on track to do. But it's not out of the question that they lose it. If that is the case, I mean, do you think that we're going to see uh, a lot of um, executive orders in the way that we saw uh, early on in Donald Trump's presidency? And if we do, how effective do you think that they will be? I mean, the executive order idea, I mean, a lot of presidents have used executive orders in order to um, bypass the system. And I really think that Joe Biden is going to have to resort to that Um, just because the Democratic Party probably will not pick up the Senate in 2022. He's going to have a very difficult four years. And I think that immediately, I mean, he's already announced that on day one, he will put forth, uh, he will sign an executive order with the national mask mandate and, you know, putting the United States back in the Paris Climate Accord. So Mm -hmm. there are a number of things that the Biden administration has already committed to on day one through executive order. So I don't think they're going to shy away from that. And we'll probably see a repeat of, late Obama in terms of how many executive orders we're going to see go through the Biden administration for the first two, maybe even four years. Just looking at the uh, midterms, you said that you're not expecting the Democrats to uh, take control of the Senate there. What do you think will be the likely outcome of the midterm elections if we do see almost from day one an almost lame duck President Biden? Do you think we're going to see a resurgence of the Republicans? How how do you think the Republicans, if we do see a resurgence of them, could potentially capitalize on that? 
Well, I think first things first, they are going to attack Joe Biden for having a lame duck administration. They are going to say it's his fault that he wouldn't compromise with the Republicans. And that is a strategy that is going to work with the American people. The American voters and the, and the American electorate itself has a very short memory. They don't really remember previous elections, nor do they remember the actions of politicians even one month prior to an election. Unless the opposition party is constantly replaying a certain clip or uh, it's a viral clip from a debate, whatever it might be, generally people forget what politicians say. And I think that the Republican Party will definitely capitalize on Joe Biden's inability to get anything done, pin it on him, and then win back the House of Representatives maybe expand their Senate majority, which may not actually happen. They could possibly lose seats, but still retain the Senate. Um, but when we're looking at where the Republican Party uh, and what they would do, the Tea Party movement was one thing. I think that we would see a, a similar effect. I don't think that the Republican Party will gain 63 seats just because there aren't that many Democratic seats for them to pick up. But I do think that they would end up winning back the House of Representatives. And this would be a great thing for their messaging if Joe Biden isn't able to get anything done substantial in the first two years, this would be very good for the Republican Party into the midterms. Do you think that this kind of inaction um, from uh, the Democratic uh, administration, if the, Joe Biden isn't able to get as much done as um, perhaps he would like, and, and this kind of toing and throwing between um, a, a lame duck Trump uh, administration to a lame duck Biden administration, do you think that this may potentially encourage people to vote for another party? Or do you think that the US system in the way that it is, is so hardwired for a two party system that even if people think, oh, well, you know, I don't think either of them are, are, are doing well, they will still vote for what they may consider the lesser of two evils? Yeah, absolutely. The American elector probably won't be too open to a multi party system for a long time. Um, with the addition of ranked choice voting potentially um, in a couple of states. I believe that's up in 2022, 2024. There were a couple up 2020. I know Maine has already implemented it. Um, even then, I don't think that third parties will get um, any more attention than they already do. Uh, in 2016, that was the time for third parties to shine. Gary Johnson at one point in time in his peak was polling at 10 points. Jill, Do Jill Stein was polling at four or five points. Uh, they both ended up winning under five. Gary Johnson got three. Uh, Jill Stein got one. And while sure, they broke records for the most votes of these third party candidates for their respective parties on the presidential level, it doesn't really matter. I mean, when we're looking at uh, Gary Johnson, you're looking at Jill Stein 2016 performance. That was probably the most we will see for a third party, even in a situation where the American people thought that they were going to have to decide between the lesser of two evils, um, they still didn't give the third party that good of a chance of winning, the third parties that we saw, uh, a good chance of winning. Neither of them were able to attend the debates. They had to meet a certain threshold. They never did. Um, on top of that, the American people still stayed with two extremely unpopular candidates just because they had a D or an R next to their name. And that's how Americans have always been. And I don't see that changing. Now, looking uh, towards 2024, what do you think are going to be the, the key battleground states in that presidential election? Well, 2024 is going to be a year where the Democratic Party is going to try to rebrand itself. This election was a lot about Trump, and they're going to have to push for certain policies uh, to be enacted in 2024. And if they are to win, if they're able to win back the United States Senate. Now, they're working with a pretty tricky map for the Senate election. So we're probably going to see uh, a slightly less progressive campaign ran then. Um, but for the swing states, I could see Texas becoming more competitive. It's growing in terms of population. It has narrowed up from 2012 to 2016 to 2020. Um, it's dropped 10 points in eight years in terms of Republican support. So uh, a little bit over 10 points, actually. So the Democratic Party definitely is going to target Texas. The trend has been that Texas is narrowing up. Um, and if they are able to tap into the voters that they lost this time to Donald Trump, if the Republicans nominate someone who can't appeal to those voters the same way Donald Trump did, um, we could see Texas, Georgia become a swing state again, North Carolina, Florida. Uh, and Florida, I think, will start out lean Republican, but we're probably going to still see a lot of money invested in it from both sides. And it could still end up going to the Democratic Party if they're able to play their cards right. Uh, so a lot of the same swing states, I think Texas, you definitely add in. I don't know if most people would consider Texas to be a swing state. A lot of people did, a lot of people didn't. But I definitely think in 2024, it will absolutely be a toss up from day one. Um, and 
I'd say the entire Sunbelt region, when we're looking around that area, you're going to see a lot of contested races. I think that the Rust Belt uh, may be slightly redder because we're seeing uh, the minority populations moving out, moving towards the Sunbelt. Um, but I would say probably a lot of the same swing states from 2020. Who do you think we're going to be seeing as the uh, candidates in 2024 for the Democratic Party and the Republicans? I mean, a lot of people have already been saying that um, Vice President-elect Harris will be the uh, front runner and people have been suggesting that Donald Trump could have another go in 2024. What do you think? I mean, there is no definitive answer as to whether or not Joe Biden is going to run again. I think a lot of people are assuming that he won't just because of his age. But he did say you know, I'm not going to rule out a second run. Um, a lot of us like talking about 2024, but until uh, President-elect Biden, soon to be President Biden, says definitively that he's not running for president, we probably won't see a major uh, party opposition to a Joe Biden re-election bid. Now, if it's an open race and Joe Biden says he's not running, well, I'd say that uh, uh, certainly Vice President-elect Harris will be the front runner, and I think she will win that primary. Um, for the Republicans, we're probably going to see either a young Republican or Donald Trump. I think Donald Trump very well could run again and win again in terms of the Republican primary. I don't think he would win the presidential level on the presidential level just because he's matching Joe Biden in terms of age. Um, on top of that, I mean, the American people have already denied him once, um, once he's gotten on the general election ballot. So so he's going to have issues if he wants to run again. But for the Republican Party, if it's not him, we could see a younger senator, a lesser known representative. Um, we could see some of these uh, solid Republican state officials end up running for president. And it could be Nikki Haley. It could be Tom Cotton. It could be a number of other people. But uh, if it's not one of them, it'll probably be Donald Trump. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the podcast. It's been great uh, speaking to you, Ethan. And I've got one final question. Now, of course, as I mentioned at the start of the uh, podcast you run a, a great youtube channel uh, let's talk elections which discusses um american elections and what's happening in the u.s at the moment so my final question to you is this if you could pick any u.s election to start commentating on uh, from the beginning all the way through to the finals or any u.s election in american history which election would you uh, choose I think this is a really boring answer, but I would say probably 2008. Um, that election, I mean, that is probably the last time in our history. We'll probably never see a result like that in decades. Um, the Democratic Party ended up winning over 250 House seats. They ended up nearing 60 seats. They won 59. Uh, they ended up with 59 Senate seats following that election. And three months before the election, John McCain was the favorite to win it. So, so much happened in the final stretch of it. And I would really like to cover uh, specifically beginning in the primary because actually Hillary Clinton was the front runner back then as well. Um, Barack Obama was a little known senator from Illinois. So that election probably broke a lot of barriers. Number one, the top two contenders uh, would have been either the first uh, African-American president or the first woman president. And John McCain also chose Sarah Palin as his VP. So there were a lot of firsts, number one. And number two, it was just such... An overall landslide near the end, but a very close race probably throughout the entirety of the campaign season up until around the final month when Obama really broke apart. But that was just such a fascinating uh, election. There was so much that happened, but uh, by the end of it, the Democratic Party did exceptionally well. But I just want to cover it if I was to go back in time, not knowing any of this, just to see how it unfolded and how both parties thought their chances were uh, in these races. And it's recent enough that we saw the internet in terms of campaign style, uh, internet usage, using YouTube, whatever it is. Um, that was something that the McCain campaign didn't exactly do as well as the Obama campaign. Um, introduction of a very large uh, portion of the electorate being young voters, first time voters. Uh, so 2008 is what I would say for that. I think that's an excellent choice. Uh, thank you again for coming on the podcast, Ethan. If anyone wants to find out more about you or your channel, where should they go? Well, it's been a pleasure and they should go to youtube.com slash let's talk elections. Everything is on there. I have over a thousand published videos, so you can probably watch them to the end of time. <laughs> excellent. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam, and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast, 
or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.